Great. Thank you for the introduction. And um, thanks for coming. Um, psyched to be here at Pi Bay. I know I've done a lot of work in some other areas like Spark. I'm not super well known in the Python community. And so I'm really appreciative of the chance to come and uh, kind of share some uh, share some messaging and chat and uh, see where we can where we can get. Um, so what I've what I've got to talk about today is this learning from human failures and successes of PySpark. So this is kind of a less technical presentation than I usually do. We're not going to be like looking at the source code of of PySpark here. Um, what I'm looking at is kind of zooming out. Spark is 10 years old. Uh, PySpark is over five years old. Um, in some ways, and it's a little nervous about saying it. In some ways, Spark, as it approaches 3.0, is moving almost towards a legacy kind of project, um, which is kind of, you know, life comes at you fast, right? Uh, but that gives us a good chance to kind of look at what's happened and get some perspective. Uh, you can't do that when things are first starting, when you're at the peak of the hype cycle. Um, and my goal here is to talk about things that are not just Spark, right? So Spark is an example. We can learn from it. But it's not just about some kind of post-mortem about some great thing or some bad thing with PySpark, right? That wouldn't be that exciting. Um, but we've got all kinds of vibrant projects in the Python community. You guys know that. That's why we're all here. And Python is, there was just a whole set of uh, comments on Twitter this past week about uh, this idea of Python eating the world. and. Uh, you know, more and more projects getting connected to Python, and why is that? And there's lots of great reasons. I don't have any specific favorite, you know, the pandas, uh, but all kinds of stuff. And as that happens, we're going to have to face some of these questions more and more that maybe we haven't haven't faced before. So let's let's dive right in. Um, a tiny bit about me. Uh, so I got my information on here. You're welcome to email me or connect to me on LinkedIn or whatever else. Um, I've been working on all kinds of technology from embedded to distributed to whatever for over 20 years. I've been teaching back end, front end, mobile, big data for over 10 years. Um, worked on all kinds of interesting projects. Uh, and maybe one thing that's kind of apropos what we're talking about here today is that my first full time job in tech was on a uh, neural network based uh, fraud scoring system for debit card transactions. And, I don't think any of it's still in use at Bank of America, but there were pieces of it that eventually became, uh, became part of that system. And the weird thing was this 20 years ago, this was based on a, a patented neural network, a very different way of looking at the world. This patented neural network, research, and then a company founded to commercialize it, and you know things happened. Uh, right now, we've got all these great open source tools. right? We've got our TensorFlow, we've got PyTorch, we've got Archive, where we, if you really want to dig into the research, you can learn about stuff as soon as it's uh, as soon as it's published. Um, but then, you know, Google recently uh, made, some, made some news for their patent on dropout, which is an important technique in neural nets. And they have a whole bunch of patents on very fundamental neural net techniques, not just Google. I'm not picking, it, picking them out. Microsoft does too. Uh, and that kind of raises this question of, you know, what kind of a world are we going to be living in in terms of the kind of stuff we can build and uh, how that interacts with the uh, the overall society. We've got patented, open source, and then maybe moving back to the patented world. So kind of thinking about what does this allow and what does it prevent. Um, so specifically, you know, talking about PySpark, you know, PySpark's a really remarkable project. Um, you know, probably anybody who's used it has had like a little bit of joy and pain from that. And so I wanted to take a few minutes, you know, we've got uh, maybe about half an hour, something like that. Um, to see what we can learn, you know, not about the tech internals, like I said, but about the interface. And what I mean by interface is kind of in many levels and many senses, right? So not, you know, sh you know, not the GUI. Ironically, the GUI is not going to appear in this talk at all. Um, what I mean by interface is how this project interacts with kind of the rest of the world, right? So the audience for the project and the design for that audience. Uh, if you're a Pythonista and you've tried to deal with Spark, you probably already have some strong opinions about that. Um, documentation and communication. Right? So there's some great, great stuff in the Spark docs. There's also really key features that have never been documented. Right? So that's kind of an issue. Um, API, maybe a little bit we'll talk about, kind of in a meta sense. Community interaction. Right? How does the community work with Spark and vice versa? Uh, what's its future place in a Python world? So we want to learn, try and learn some lessons. And I, I said maintain empathy at the same time. And the reason I said maintain empathy is not just because we want to be nice people and you know, it's, it's, it's a, a kind of a good way to communicate if you expect people to be receptive to what you're communicating. But because what we've got here is a complex system, 
right? A complex system with many elements that mutually interact. And our kind, of, uh, our kind of monkey brains want to go to a much simpler story. We want to point a finger. We want to say, oh, Darth Vader's the bad guy. You know, Luke versus Darth Vader is really simple until it turns out that Darth Vader is Luke's father. And then things get really, really complicated. And the world is complicated. So I don't want to take up your time um, you know, pointing fingers and presenting simple solutions, because there aren't any. What we want to do is understand uh, the system. Um, and I kind of thought of this nice example uh, that involves an interface failure in kind of the larger sense, right? So on the left here is an Airbus A320. Um, on the right is a Boeing 737 MAX. Um, they're both great airplanes. They've flown millions of people around. They, they, they're reasonably fuel efficient. They do all kinds of nice aviation things. And you might say, well, this plane is a complex system. And it's not simple, but that's not the level of complexity I'm talking about. There's a bigger level of complexity. And that the, the failure at the interface of that larger level of complexity is where you can get some really, uh, some really just different outcomes, depending on how you play that interface. Right? On the left, uh, that's uh, Chesley Sullenberger's miracle on the Hudson. Right? After a bird strike, he landed his Airbus A320 in the Hudson. Um, and the interface, and again, I'm going to talk about this in a larger sense, the interface allowed him to do that. So he made some good decisions, but the interface made it easy for him to do the right thing and made it harder for him to do the wrong thing right? at lots of different levels. On the right, that's kind of a sad picture with some workers picking through the rubble of one of the recent 737 MAX crashes. The plane works just fine. right? The issue here was that there was an interface at many levels that went wrong. And so it made it harder for the pilots, who were perfectly competent, to do what they were trying to do. It made it easy for them to do the wrong thing. You can imagine in an airline emergency, it's pretty easy to do the wrong thing to begin with. And it made it really hard to do the right thing. Right? They were fighting against systems physically, but we'll see they were fighting against some other things as well. So it's not just the physical interface. right? The physical interface is kind of a, a, a no-op here. right? So in the Airbus, there's a little side stick on the left, and it's kind of electronic. And, uh, on the right, we've got the Boeing kind of standard old school yoke, and it's a semi-mechanical. Um, but that, that wasn't the issue, right? Any of these pilots could, could work this, the stick. This is the system in the interface that we're dealing with, right? So it is a, there's a lot of pieces, right? We've got the operations manual for the aircraft. This was critical because what do you say to the pilot about how to work the plane? Well, depending on what you say, that might require different training, right? And so that involves costs. And so then you get Wall Street involved. And Wall Street likes short-term profits, but they also like long-term confidence in being able to fly because the economy like, relies on that. So that's not simple either. Right? Somewhere in the middle, you've got the uh, aviation regulations. So that book has most of the r r rules around building and certificating airplanes and flying, at least in the United States. And much of the world kind of takes its lead from that. Right? So, well, how are those rules created? How are they enforced? Right? That's complicated. And then you've got you know, your congressional hearing about that. Uh, and we've got the culture inside of Boeing. Right? So there was a, a kind of a, a defense contractor element. And that's why I've got the nice picture of the Pentagon there. And there's also the civil aviation component. Right? And the cultures and priorities were different. And I'm not here, I don't have enough information, and I'm not here to judge how exactly that went. But it's, everybody pretty much agrees there were some conflicts about priorities that, that connected to this. So this is what I mean about a complex system. Right? And the interface is how the public, how we, as the non-people making and flying the planes, interact with the airline and the, well, not really the airline, but the planes themselves. Right? That's the interface I'm talking about. So there's lots of ways it can go right and lots of ways it can go wrong. And one of the interesting things about this that's uh, an aspect of a lot of complex systems, maybe not all of them, is this idea of criticality. So the idea is that for this range of parameters, all the pieces in here work together. They mutually re reinforce to create a safe, efficient system for flying. And then this set of parameters over here, they're kind of centripetal. It's the opposite. right? They, um, things are actually coming apart. And they don't support each other. And we don't know where in between this set of parameters and that set of parameters this critical boundary lies. Right? As humans, we're really bad at kind of predicting that, these kind of sudden phase changes. Like we, we can look at it kind of statistically, and we know that these exist, but we don't know. right? And so it's really hard to figure out where to push these boundaries. Um, so that's kind of the perspective here. And we'll take a look at a few examples in Spark. So just a quick poll first. Who here has heard of Spark, Apache Spark? OK, almost everybody. I guess like if we're going to have a kind of a self-selecting group. How many people have used Spark at all? 
few people. Okay, that's okay. If you haven't, that's fine. Um, how many people have used PySpark, the Python front end? Okay, cool. Loved it, hated it, both. I think if you've used it, you're probably, yeah, <laughs> both, right? Um, how many for analytics and data science? A few people. And how many for just data engineering, tuning, back end? Okay, so people there too. Okay, yeah, I'm just, just curious. Um, so we'll look at a few examples of, of things in here. So um, a big success early on, right, was making real Python work in a JVM world. And by JVM world, what I mean is that the big data world in most commercial businesses, so I'm kind of carving out universities, maybe in some research areas as being separate, um, in large companies, the Hadoop stack and the JVM kind of ecosystem was dominating in big data. So that's one of the reasons, you know, Spark uh, is living in that world. But people wanted to integrate Python. And they wanted to integrate real Python tools, right? Things like NumPy, things with all of the great native extensions. So not Jython. In other words, not just the, the, the surface language of Python, which you can run in the JVM with Jython, but actual Python VMs that can do real Python stuff. Right? And so that was, that was really kind of a huge victory, is discovering that, discovering there are people who wanted to scale Python out, and needed to do real Python work with it, and were willing to kind of make some compromises and, and meet in the middle. So Spark came out in 2009, um, and the really early versions you know, weren't widely known or used. By 2013, when things were picking up, PySpark shows up right in Spark 0.7. Uh, that was the same year that Spark was donated to the Apache Foundation and the Databricks was founded. Um, and uh, that was really kind of a, a great observation that, hey, there's a whole other world of people out here that are not Java people. And if we can help somehow bridge this tool over to their world, we can get a lot more people involved and do a lot of other interesting things. Um, Right, so we can use the core Spark scheduler, which is a JVM-based system, to feed lots of Python VMs. Um, now, there are some catches in there, lots of catches, as you probably have known if you used it. But again, I'm not going to dive way down into the technical end. Uh, one that I thought's worth calling out, because it still seems to cause a lot of confusion, is from the very beginning, because of the scheduling overhead and the way Spark works, Spark isn't effective on a single machine. Like, if you can run something with Spark on a single machine, you can run it better without Spark on that single machine. 100% of the time, right? So it's a little bit difficult. And again, I, when I think of this from a communications and community point of view, not that the technology, I, I saw just another tutorial just the other week. Oh, let's get started using doing machine learning with Python. And it was all about ML with Spark in like local mode on one machine. It's like, and there was, wasn't even a line in there to say like, this is not how you ever want to actually operate this. Like you're just, you're, you're wasting your time and burning money if you do this. Um, there's a lot of confusion about that. Um, you know, people want to run something on their laptop, and they, they see that it runs, and it's it's we have to you know figure out how to communicate about that clearly. Um, the next one I want to talk about, which is also a big success here, was making scale out Python machine learning modeling real, and that's kind of a mouthful. Uh, I know not not everybody here is coming from like the data science or machine learning world, but in a nutshell, what we mean by ML modeling is taking a whole bunch of data records and Typically, you know, rearranging that, rearranging that information a little bit, and then using one or more uh, well-known algorithms to find patterns from that data. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, so there's lots of ways to do that. That's you know obviously a huge trend in the industry right now. And prior to 2014 or so, there was no easy, real way to scale this out with Python. And by scale out, what I mean is. You, you have data that requires many, many machines to process, but you want to build a single model over that data. Right? That's the hard part. So there's, if you look at you know, all the literature, most of the traditional research on machine learning algorithms are step-by-step -step algorithms that don't account for parallel, parallelism models. Right? And then you can, you, know, you can learn how to do other, other approaches. But it's not easy. There was no tool that you could just download, pip install, run it, and like run across all this big data. So bringing that to PySpark, this was huge. Right? Um, this showed up in 2014 in Spark 0.9. Uh, the first version uh, was this RDD-based machine learning API. Um, not very easy to use. So I put a thumbs up because it's great that it existed. Right? This is like a maybe not an absolutely universal first, but a practical first. Um, but very few people grok the functional programming that you needed to actually do feature extraction or, or feature engineering here, right? So if you had a bunch of data and you knew how to write a SQL query to 
you know, pull out the pieces you needed. Good luck doing that with that RDD API. That's all I'm going to say. It is very, very hard to do. Um, for the people who really love functional programming, they were used to thinking that way, and they could kind of get it together. But even once they did that, try communicating that to your boss or the, the guy in the cube next to you. Right? So that, that was really tricky. Um, also, the Spark data proc wasn't very performant on Python. Um, not going to get into the super details about why that is, but it just was not. Right? It, the system was, the core Spark system was Java. It doesn't understand Python objects. Uh, when it scheduled and moved Python things around, they all had to be cloud pickled byte arrays um, in Java. So you just didn't have it. You didn't. The system wasn't really playing nice together, right? So and the, and the bottom one is kind of the, the big takeaway. Like SciPy had already been around for a long time. There's tons and tons of uh, scientists, engineers using SciPy tools, and this was not the same model. This was a very very different model. And the and the, the pitch was, but you can scale out, which is true. But it was a huge, huge mental shift. It was really, really hard. So that, that was maybe not, maybe not the greatest thing. Uh, things improved a bit in 2015 uh, when the Spark SQL and data frame infrastructure was added to the system. So this was an API. It had lots of elements to it, including SQL. Um, and a data frame style API I'll talk about in a, in a minute. Um, one of the biggest things was this was an API where it was easier to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. So in the early days of Spark, you know, and I don't want to make plane crash comparisons because that's just maybe in bad taste, but in the, in the early days of Spark, system doing things that make complete sense to a normal human. Right? It was, you had to know way too much about the guts of the system to work around that. And one of the things that was improved here was that it was harder to make those mistakes. Like the, the API was constructed in a way to make that more difficult. You could still do it if you really, really wanted to, but you were less likely to do it by accident. So that was a big deal. Um, and going to where people were actually doing, so where were people doing data science and analytics and modeling? They were doing it in the Python world, well, and R, right? So R and Python, and I'm leaving out the proprietary tools like you know, SPSS and, and all of that stuff. Um, but in the open source world, it was R and Python. So what this did is it brought an R interface and a Python interface that was a little bit more usable. Uh, and the great thing there is that that expanded the Spark community and expanded the Python community, right? So if you were in Python, it now allowed you to, to, to add new skills to your arsenal, solve new problems. Uh, for Spark, it allowed them to bring a lot more people in. And this point at the bottom, right, this was, this was kind of a big breakthrough. If you had large-scale institutional analytics projects, you know, big banks, governments, that kind of thing, um, at that scale, it would have been harder, it would have been harder to do that before. Right, so this this made it possible to you know keep a straight face and propose that maybe you know some huge banking project be done using Python at least as the front end uh, and Spark together for doing these. But uh, this is where we have to confront some you know some some of the things that you know maybe made us put that other hand up earlier when we were doing the little survey, right? So the data frame EPS was inspired by pandas and it has data frames. And that was maybe one of the, maybe in retrospect, not the, the exact best way to pitch this, right? Because the API was kind of like pandas, but not really like pandas. Um, like, it required a whole new thought process, because Spark is based on this idea of data parallelism, right? Which is running the same code on different chunks of data in lots of different places. And even more tricky than that, it was all based on out of core. So it was based on dealing with data sets that were way too large to fit in RAM. Right? So you have to swap or iterate through data. And you put those two things together, like the, the iteration, which means that you, you never really have all the data you're looking for in any one place. What you really have are recipes for pulling that data, like an iterator, and you're composing those together. That's really different from the way Pandas works. Right? When you, where in Pandas, you just have the data. You can do whatever you want to it. Right? And then the parallel stuff is tricky too. Right? So in pandas, you, know, you can sort things or you can you know, look things up easily by the index. Spark doesn't have indexes. Uh, and in Spark, you, if you want to sort things, you want to look something up by, that requires you know, kind of rearranging all of the data. Right? And that's not the end of the world. I mean, that, that's life in a parallel data universe here. But if you don't know about that, it's really frustrating. <laughs> Right, so this the lesson here is kind of be thoughtful with naming and metaphors. 
there's hard stuff that you have to go through to get from pandas to doing data frame stuff with Spark. And really, arguably, we should make this stuff really clear. Just say, look, here are the top three hard things. If you make it over this hump, you'll be OK. But if we say, oh, it's easy, it's like pandas, and then you're a pandas expert, and you use it, and it fails, it's like, well, is it my fault? You feel bad. Everybody feels bad. But it's like, you know, and your boss feels bad because the project's not running. Right, so that, and that's, it's, you know, we have to be kind of careful about that. And you can start to see why you might, where that complex system stuff feeds in, right? There's reasons why you want to say it's like pandas, because there's all these pandas users. There's also reasons why you might want to say it's not like pandas, so that they don't get stuck. And there's, there's conflicting kind of influences. Um, interestingly, we're kind of on the verge of maybe repeating this with a project called Koalas. I think there's a talk here about that. Um, if not, there's, there's other stuff online. And that's another wrapper for uh, Spark that's meant to be even more like Pandas in terms of the API. And that's another, that's, that's an open problem. I'm, I don't have a super strong opinion on it, but it's dicey, right? Because on the one hand, it's like, sure, if you know Pandas, why should you have to learn a different, say, filter syntax, right? So if you know how to do filtering with Pandas and masks, it's like, great, you can use that. On the other hand, remember, in Spark, you don't have all the data. You, you don't have indices. So there's lots of stuff you can do with pandas that will just work. And if you wrote that code and Koalas makes it run on Spark, it might take a month to run. Well, maybe I'm exaggerating, but not by that much. There are things you can do that will just basically bring that, bring that project to a halt. And they're per perfectly reasonable things in pandas. So mm, Koalas is a tricky thing. Uh, similar challenges with things like uh, you know Spark ML, right? So one of the things was Spark ML is inspired by Scikit-Learn, and and it is, right? It's got estimators and it's got transformers and it's got pipelines and it's got things like dot fit, but it's not the same. Um, there's things that you can't do, right? And the the issue is, you know, like with pandas, it's not that it, it's it, the issue isn't the Spark needs to be different, right? It it does, and other data parallel systems like Dask have to be somewhat different also. Um, but it's the it's that if we don't highlight those issues, if we downplay them, people get stuck. And one of the things I've really noticed in the in the last couple of years of consulting is, as more and more projects are related to to Spark ML and not just basically running Spark, is how many major teams and major companies with very talented people who are experts in stats and ML and everything else cannot get this stuff to work, right? So saying it's easy is not a solution. Um, there are things that just, you know, and it, the reasons for this are complicated, but um, it's it, the interface, the, the cultural interface, the API interface, the communications, the documentation, uh, all of that stuff um, does not make it easy to succeed with these tools. Right? And sometimes teams don't even realize they're not succeeding. They're running something and it runs. It just takes 40 hours and it should take 15 minutes. But they're not, you know, they, they don't realize that. So here's an example. But first, so anybody have, a, of, the, of the, if you've used Spark or even if you haven't, does anybody have a guess? What's the number one question, the number one problem that people have with Spark by far nowadays? Yeah, it definitely falls under set. It definitely falls under setup. It, but and, and I'm I'm with you on there. But it's a specific, a specific, slightly more specific. Well, I mean, like when is it appropriate for a problem? Yeah. So those are those are all, those are all those are all valid issues. Absolutely. And so I 100% am on board with that. The one that I would say, and I would say those are all in the, in the top five, no question. The one that I was thinking in my in my mind that the number everybody thinks of seven, right? You say think of a number. The number, thing I was thinking of was partitions, right? How many partitions am I supposed to have? How big are they? And like, how do I? What is this? I've got cores. I've got partitions. I've got tasks. Like, I just throw it against the wall and see what happens. Do I tune it? Uh, you know, is there a formula for this? There isn't, by the way, right? So this is kind of a, a big problem. And to, to even, like, make more emphasis, since we all love a good airline IT story, um, this is one of the more egregious examples I saw, was um, one of the major airlines in the US was doing some fairly simple data enrichment uh, for their you know, flight scheduling stuff. Um, they had a, about 15 executors. Those are the worker nodes in a Spark cluster. Their average throughput of data was around 10 megabytes per hour. Okay, now 
if you have a laptop on here, you could write Python in that hour that would do that work and still do more in the same hour, including writing the code. If you have an iPhone on you, you probably couldn't write the app on the phone, but that phone should be able to beat this benchmark. right? And you know they had a 40 node cluster, and they were using 15 nodes at a time. And you know I don't want to get down into the details of that. But the point is, and the point is also not to say, well, look, aren't they goofy, right? That's like a fun, fun thing to say, but that's not what's going on. How did, how were they supposed to know? Oh, they should have asked for help. They did ask for help. They worked with uh, one of the major cloud vendors that like supported their installation. They, they didn't have any better advice for them either, right? The system was complicated. The system was working against the people trying to use it, right? And so this is it. This is the biggest problem by far, by a mile, partitioning and tasks. Right? It depends, which is the answer you get. How many partitions am I supposed to have? It depends. Well, that's great for sales, right? whether you're a consultant or whatever else. But it's terrible for problem solving. Right? It, you know, it just doesn't really help. This is the biggest problem. Can't we fix it? Well, huh, the, this is where the plot thickens a little bit. right? Um, several years ago, I think we're talking about five years ago now, there was a JIRA called Spark 9850. Um, Matei Zaharia, the guy who wrote Spark, actually did the first chunk of work on that. This was before he um, got in, uh, took up his current academic positions. And the idea here was to make Spark automatically calculate the number of partitions as it performed operations. So basically, auto-tune. Like, really, really big deal. Even if it only solved it in 10% of the cases, and it probably would have done better, um, addressing this big thing, which to this day is still the biggest roadblock, would have been huge. But it never got finished. No one really knows why. right? We, could, we, could, we don't really know why. There's a lot of possibilities, but it didn't. Um, well, some enterprising folks at Intel and I think Baidu also started again a couple years later creating another, even more sophisticated auto-tuning system for Spark. Right? And it could automatically figure out the partitions. And it could automatically optimize joins. And they got the code to the point where it could merge directly into the Spark code base. And I'm not going to click through to the web here because we're short on time. But if you look at that Intel GitHub link, you can download a build of Spark from Intel under that Spark Adaptive project that has this stuff built in. right? And it will automatically tune. It's not the Apache Spark master branch, but it will do that. You can also run it in Alibaba Cloud. Right, as a service, right? So not in Amazon, not in Google, unless you put the Intel one up there yourself. Um, and most American companies don't run their stuff in Alibaba Cloud. But the point is, this code has been ready to run for a couple of years. It was presented at Spark Summit a couple of times, including you know early 2018. Where is that code now? Well, it looks like out of the three major features in there, we'll get two of them maybe in Spark 3.0 which means that maybe we'll get two thirds of this in the master branch by the beginning of next year. And a lot of companies, because of various ways that the system is supported and deployed, are a couple versions behind. So who knows how much more gray hair I'm going to have by the time this, like, you know, these, these, these fixes ever come out. But they're already there, right? So this is, this is kind of a complicated thing. It's like Intel's a big supporter of Spark. So, but you know, there's a lot of players, and it's complicated. So this is where the, the lessons get maybe a little more abstract. So the Apache Software Foundation has these rules around project independence. But there, you know, it's still it's a cultural thing, really. Um, you know, Apache doesn't go around. You know, occasionally they they'll threaten people over a trademark or something. But they, you know, it's not super heavy-handed. This is a little bit of a, a cultural institution, and maybe that those project independence guidelines just are not strong enough. Um, because they can lead to conflicts of interest, they can lead to um, PRs being merged on for various reasons that are not necessarily, you know, simply the priority of is the code useful and good. And so maybe we need something, uh, maybe we need something stronger there. Um, this is going to be of increasing interest in the Python community as uh, you know, again, like you know, Python, you know, eating the world more and more companies are moving more and more important critical projects onto Python-related tools uh, for a lot of reasons. But the machine learning and AI stuff is a big part of that. right? So we need to kind of think about this ahead of time if we want to continue this golden age of open source. right? We have to, This is kind of an amazing time right now. I mean, the amount of stuff that you can get and run for free and read the code and hack the code uh, is pretty remarkable. 
it may or may not last, right? So we need to kind of deal with the complexity here. What this picture is from, a, I think it's called Poachers Apprehended. Um, this is so in you know over the period of several hundred years, but especially in the late 1700s, there was a process of enclosing the commons in England, right? So taking common land that people could graze on or even grow stuff, and then uh, you know wealthier and more powerful folks, and even some of the kind of middle class folks through political and other mechanisms, basically <laughs> taking taking control of that. Uh, in order to extract the value, because commons are valuable, right? You see, Golden Gate Park's really valuable. You know how much money you can make if you could just get a little strip off of that and build a condo complex, right? I mean, so they're going to attract attention, right? Believe me, if a company could buy, if Amazon could buy San Francisco Public Library and shut it down, like, they probably would. And I'm not criticizing that from a business point of view. It makes total sense, right? So it's only the fact that we have this public library we don't allow people to buy it you know, that's keeping it there. And Golden Gate Park, so far, isn't advertiser supported. And it's, it's public. But it, you know, there's certainly interest. It's, it's very valuable land, right? So we need to be realistic about that, right? Let's not pretend, oh, no, no, nobody would ever. No, let's just be realistic. Right? Each square inch of Golden Gate Park is really valuable. We need to know, what it, you know how we're going to run these parks if we want them to be available for the public. Right? There are going to be conflicts of interest and perverse incentives. Again, let's be realistic about that. So the idea isn't to say, you know, well, oh my god, I would never do something like that. It's like, let's, let's be realistic. We live, in a, you know, we live in a world with lots of individuals, lots of different motivations. And these are all like statistical properties. You may have 100 people, and 10 of them will always do something wrong. And 10 of them will never do something wrong, right? But everybody in the middle, right, it's tricky. It depends on what's going on in their lives and their circumstances and, and everything else. So let's, be, let's acknowledge this, and we'll, we'll kind of think about what we could do. Um, you know, let's have empathy, right? So again, think about complex systems. Don't go to uh, Darth Vader's the bad guy, right? It's, there's, everybody has some reasons for what they're doing. And those reasons themselves are complicated, right? People are complicated. So we can't demand purity. If we have purity tests, uh, you know, none of this is going to work. We shouldn't probably expect purity. I mean, very few people are, are saints or villains. What we can do is foster favorable circumstances for desired outcomes. Now, just to motivate this a little, like, why, what, am I, what am I going on about here? Why would I even be concerned about something like this? So here's, here's an interesting job ad, just from a couple of months ago. So next generation data processing engine. So it's a little small to read. I'm going to kind of read this quickly. Uh, in the last 10 years, we witnessed rapid development of data technologies under the umbrella of big data. They're still too difficult to use. Yeah. Too slow sometimes. Not smart enough. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Now, we talked about there's some a lot of work that's been done to solve some of those problems that hasn't made it into some of those tools. We think we can change that by building a next generation engine that requires little tuning, doesn't run out of memory. If you've struggled with tuning, struggled with memory, these are really sweet words to hear. Adapts to the data layout and runs blazingly fast. That sounds pretty good. And there's some features that it should have. Now, I've truncated this ad, but I can tell you that nowhere in this ad does it talk about Apache or Spark or open source. Now, if I'm just starting a new company to work on data, this is great, right? There's a need in the market. Let's go create something. If the company that is doing this has a large influence, let's just say, in the Spark community, this, this is a really tricky piece, right? It's like, well, business, open source, community, right? If you don't have the major source of contributors and funding for a project, right? That's more than just having a competitor. You see, you see what I'm getting at here. It's not just st starting up a new competitor to something, which is great. You know, it's, it's maybe some of that enclosure of the commons that we're talking about, depending on how you want to look at it. And it's, you know, it, it, there's always an incentive there's always some incentive to, to do that, right? We're here in San Francisco, more billionaires here, right, than any place else in the world. So, you know, how do we get those billionaires? We, we take a bunch of money and we inject it into some kind of a perfectly functional pony. And, you know, sometimes we get the mutant pony and sometimes we get the dead pony, but every so often we get the unicorn, right? And so, you know, there's, let's just be realistic about that, right? It's, it's, 
You know, it's really easy to talk about things in the abstract. It's a lot harder when someone waves a check in front of you that has like, you know, eight or nine digits on it. And, you know, it all depends on where you're coming from and what you've done before and, you know, what your options are. And, you know, and it's, it's a tough world. And I'm very empathetic about that. So it's like, how do we, we don't want to leave this on the individual, right? There's almost, you know, it's very hard if I took anybody in this room and like put them in a room and said, by themselves, would you be willing to like, you know, do such and such to the Python Software Foundation if I wrote you this check for 100 million bucks, right? That's a really tough test for people to pass. It's just, you know, it's really tough. Um, what we can do is we can work together to try and make it less likely that these things are going to happen. And I'll give a couple of, of examples. So, um, so things we want to, what do we want to accomplish here? So we'd like to make it harder to enclose or destroy the commons. Um, We'd like to make it harder to plant flags to discourage innovation. What I mean by flag planting here is when uh, an organization that mostly focuses on this sees that an industry is interested in that, and they go, we're going to do something over there, too. And I call it flag planting because they're not actually doing anything serious. What they're doing is putting a flag there that says to everyone else, one, if you come over there, you might have to deal with us, and two, even if you are over there and your stuff is much better, we've got a bigger name than you. We've got a bigger flag, so you better watch out. Right, that, lots of organizations do that. Like, that's a hostile behavior. Uh, FUD, right? that's a classic from 20 plus years ago. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Make, make, make potential customers or users worry that other products uh, may not be up to the task. They might go away. You heard a rumor that the, the main committer there had a disease. You heard a rumor that these guys were going to you know, you know, retire and you know, move to another country. Right? That kind of stuff. Um, and then launching private expeditionary code forces. So that's a little bit like flag planting, only that's where you actually send people in to go write some code. And at one level, that seems great, like, especially if it's open source. It's like, well, you're funding people to write code. Isn't this exactly what we want? It's for organizations with resources to fund people to contribute code. Well, if the only purpose for that code, if the only reason it exists is to serve a business purpose that's actually over here and not there, it gets a little dicey. Because first, we're not going to let the community control that. right? We need to control it because it's critical to our business. Um, if, we, uh, if, if we don't like what's going on there, we'll, we can just kill it. If we decide to abandon it because we never allowed it to have an organic community, it's going to go away, which means anybody who depends on that is, is going to be in a difficult situation. right? So, and there are a lot of organizations that do this. If you kind of look carefully, you'll see. Um, and what we'd like to do is, you know, of course, we're not going to ban this. We're not going to stop people from doing it. What we can do is make it a little less appealing, a little less likely. Um, what I was thinking in terms of things like nudges and, and reified constraints. So nudges, you know, really popular in the psychological literature, kind of these little, very soft bumps that statistically make it more likely people will do something. Like if you default people into a retirement account, it's more likely they'll save than if you give them the exact same privileges, but you make them open the account themselves. When you open a repo in GitHub and it has that little drop down where you can pick a license, right? that's a great nudge. Because we all might want a license on our, of some kind on our code, but it's like, oh, I got to figure out which one. I got to copy it. I got to make, make sure it's the right one. You, know, you pick from the drop down. It's really easy. So that's kind of a nudge. Now, the license itself is the reified constraint. right? The license itself, that actually has some binding force. It's not just a nudge. So um, if we pick the wrong license, that could really hurt our project. If we pick the right license, maybe it, maybe it helps us. Now, those are just little examples. I don't pretend to have all the answers for this, but I think it's really, really worth thinking about um, how we can foster you know, alternative approaches uh, whether it's research institutions, whether it is specific licenses, whether it's um, uh, different kinds of governing bodies or whatever else that allow us to work together and be confident that we're all on the same team and we're all working together. You see what I'm saying? So much of open source and these kind of communal projects is based on trust. Uh, not only trusting people and code, but trusting that the project is, is going to be around, that your contributions are valued. If you're the one who's um, accepting the contributions and trying to like, do code reviews and all of that, you know, this, the, everything kind of mutually supports. So just to kind of wrap up, um, that this, is, this is kind of one way to just remind ourselves that it's, you know, it's not about individuals. It's about customs, culture, and, and systems. Uh, this is Tolstoy. Uh, talking about Napoleon and saying, you know, Napoleon, you know, on, on, on paper, he's the king. But 
maybe, you know, maybe that he's the slave of history. Maybe he is uh, actually doing nothing but what would have had to happen based on the complex dynamics that are surrounding him. And so that's what I'm saying uh, in terms of these software projects, whether it is a, a committer or a founder or an organization that contributes money or a university or whatever else, they're not in isolation, right? They, they have a lot of power, but in a way they may not have any power, right? So if there's a project, let's say, at Stanford or Berkeley, there's a lot of pressure to commercialize that in a way that there might not be if it was at University of Wisconsin-Madison, right? It's, you see what I'm saying? It's complicated. And you, know, you could say, well, but I'm not interested in commercializing this project or not in that way. Well, yeah, but that connects into who your advisors are and you want to get your thesis approved. And you know, these, these universities in the Bay Area are interlocked with the VC community and the VC community has very specific goals that they need to meet. So um, these, this is a complicated situation, but we really need to pay attention to it uh, because I think one of the biggest takeaways, uh, you know, looking back on Spark is that it's a great, it's, it's big enough to be a great place to study and learn all the things that can go right and, and maybe some things that can go wrong uh, in terms of making these projects work for the community. So kind of the, the final lesson here is let's, when I said let's keep working together to keep working together, what I mean is let's collaborate to come up with frameworks that that allow future collaboration, right? Let's keep our, let's stay in that area that set of parameters where everything mutually reinforces and we get all the wonderful tools and libraries that we're hearing about this weekend uh, and that we can pip install and that we can download and we can contribute to um, and avoid a situation you know, that maybe things come apart, uh, which certainly can happen. So let's see, yeah, I just have a couple minutes left. I know we're getting close to lunch, so um, if there's any questions. Yeah, no, that's that's actually. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so the question was, uh, a lot of people would like to use Spark to do uh, maybe reporting, feature extraction, uh, some feature engineering, and then feed it into PyTorch to train models. Uh, and the question is, is that a good a pattern, or would it be make more sense to use Spark all the way through, like Spark ML? Um, and I would say, no. I think that using PyTorch for the training is a great pattern. Um, PyTorch is really, really versatile. It scales out easily using Horovod. Um, the one little piece of glue that's handy to put in between there is a thing called Petastorm. It's an open source library from uh, Uber. And what it does is it accounts for the fact that in the, in the, on the Spark world, you typically have column-based data formats like Parquet. But when you ingest data into deep learning frameworks, they typically want to come in as like dense matrices where you've got a row-based format. So Petastorm is an open source project that Uber created that kind of, it's just a little bit of glue that helps bridge that. It helps you efficient, performantly retrieve chunks of data that are columnar from Parquet uh, and kind of reshape them and feed them in a way that keeps your GPUs busy. Um, but by all means, yeah, I, mean, I think we're seeing more and more of things like PyTorch on Horovod, TensorFlow on Horovod, and um, you know, and then the, the interesting question is, well, how, you know, how do, what, how do we deal with that, that first part? Awesome, thank you.